Yo, what's up guys, this is Characters and welcome to the brand new series. Um, it is basically season 3 of the How to Master 6 Max Cash Extravaganza. Um, this time, what we're going to do is go over basically all the stuff we went over last time, but we're going to sort of adapt it to the modern era. That is, we're going to adapt it to 2012 and talk about what's changed in the games and how these concepts apply. Maybe some don't apply so much anymore, maybe some apply even more, maybe there are new concepts that we're going to bring into. Um, talk about what's changed in the games and stuff. Um, the emphasis this time round is going to be mainly on gameplay. So, in the we are going to have some presentations, you know, to get us off on the right foot. But what we're also going to do, let me just start my slideshow. That's better. So, what we're also going to do is um, go over a lot of example hand histories, maybe some live play and stuff like that as well, just to sort of illustrate the concepts. Because the last How to Master Six Max. Uh, six max cash, which if you haven't seen by the way, I'd recommend you go back to watch it. It's got its own special section on Grinder School. You can find it under How to Master Six Max Cash. So we're gonna have a lot to cover in this season. It's like a huge long season with plenty of goodies to look forward to. There are five like main sort of things we're gonna be covering, but we're gonna be covering each in like lots of different ways, talking about spots to do them, spots not to do them. So as you can see here, we start off with check raising, that's what today's video is gonna be about. A short pro presentation on check raising in two thousand twelve, followed by some other goodies. Um we're gonna you know, the general format of this is gonna be that we're gonna move on to do hand histories in the second part of each topic so next time around there'll be a full length video with just pure hand histories illustrating these points and that's the thing that there wasn't really enough of in the last How to Master um, series that I made so there'll be plenty of that to look forward to we're then going to throw in shorts about you know we've talked about when to do it, what good spots to do it, when should we not do it because when people watch videos sometimes they can get a little bit overexcited and just take away um, from the video that they need to do X a lot more but they might not necessarily do X in all the right spots so when to not do it should hopefully guide you so that you're not ending up sort of spewing too much by C betting the hell out of every board or check raising every opponent or 3 betting every open preflop. Um, then we're going to move on to talk about bet sizing, we're going to do a similar sort of thing. Then we're going to move on to 3 betting, we're going to do a similar sort of thing as you can see. And we're going to move on to playing draws and then C betting. So it's basically the same 5 topics that we went over last time round but we're totally expanding them, modernizing them and illustrating them in a lot more depth and clarity this time. So loads to look forward to. If you want to pause the video and take a good look over all of that just to get an idea of what's coming feel free but I'm gonna move on now. Okay, check raising in two thousand and twelve. What do I mean by check raising first of all? When we check on the flop and then we raise a C bet. I've called this check raising, it doesn't necessarily have to be check raising, but the idea is that we're going to be raising a bet on the flop made by the opponent, and this kind of thing is generally referred to as check raising, even if we're in position and the opponent bets and then we raise. I'm also going to be covering spots like that, but a much snappier title for this is check raising, it sounds cool. You know the check raise is like the, one of the more glamorous plays in poker, if we can call any play that, which I think we can. Um, so yeah, but bear in mind there are going to be spots where we are in position where we haven't checked yet and I'm mainly going to be talking about on the flop. You know, there are plenty of spots to check raise on the turn and river as well, but they're a lot rarer and they're not really things that you do so much in the micro stakes and low stakes, although there are situations for them. Upon request I can certainly do some podcasts about that or I can make a full length video after this series, so let me know if you want to see some stuff like that. But for now the spots we're going to be discussing are going to all be sort of on the flop. Alright, so what we're going to discuss in this little presentation is going to be, first of all, check raising as a bluff. This is like the most sort of difficult aspect of check raising. It's very easy for you to flop a set on a wet board and know that you're going to check raise and get lots of money in. You know, these things sort of come to you intuitively even when you first start playing poker. You don't need a lot of guidance to know what are good spots to check raise for value in, although I will be touching on that and sort of outlining some common misconceptions where people sort of value check raise too much or indeed where people don't do it enough in totally different situations but as a bluff is going to be where the real sort of nitty gritty you know factoring approach comes in we'll be looking at factors such as board texture and opponent type um, equity backdoor draws barreling prospects these kind of things um, then we're going to move on to the value part and then we're going to look at what's new in 2012 
Um, the last How to Master series was made, I believe, in 2011, just over a year ago. So what changed in the last year? And a lot of the time the answer to that is going to be at the micro is not a whole lot, but as you move up, these are the things you need to be aware of. I do think the micro games have changed, but when it comes to really aggro things like check raising, I don't necessarily think there's always a huge difference, but I will talk about any differences that I do think have evolved in that time. And also just how I think the games are going and how important it's going to be to have to check raise, because I think in the way things are going in a few years' time, as long as there's not like another enormous poker boom or something, we are going to have to be finding all the sort of thin edges that we can and doing a lot more, doing a lot more sort of aggro stuff and getting what we'd call out of line and moving away from that ABC style in order to be profitable. Because the way the games are going, if you just learn ABC in that set, it's no longer the case that you can move up through to, you know, mid stakes just by playing a very tight, solid game. Um, if you table select like an absolute god, then maybe, but it's not going to be too likely. Um, what I'm going to do at the end of this video is some live play mixed stakes. I hope to only spend about 20 minutes on the actual presentation, then we can spend maybe, you know, 25 minutes, half an hour actually grinding and talking about spots as they come up. I think it's cool the way this series is going to work because in the first episode you're going to get the presentation with some live play to sort of drill home the ideas as they come up and then you're going to have a more structured review of hands that are definitely very good examples of what we've been talking about in the next section. Obviously with live play you never know for sure if you're going to get the best spots or not but usually something's going to come up and we're going to be looking to check raise as much as possible more than usual and make sure that we get some good situations for that. Okay so as a bluff um, there's a lot of things if you've watched the last How to Master series which I'd imagine checking out before you watch this or you know sort of simultaneously around the same time as you're watching this. Try and check them out as well. Get as much sort of info on the topic as you can. But if you've watched those then you'll recognise a few of these factors here like board texture and stuff. So firstly board texture, what do we, what do we mean by that? We mean um, the way the board is constituted when a flop comes down. Remember we're going to be talking mostly about doing this on the flop. So wet versus dry. What does this mean? So basically on a wet board when you've got like jack 10, 8 of clubs, it's very wet and that there are a lot of flush draws, straight draws, so a lot of big hands people have. People play a lot of cards around that sort of um, rank if you like. So two pair of sets, uh, top pair, top pair plus draw, you know, top pair plus straight draw, top pair plus flush draw sets. I think I've said sets. Yeah, you get the picture. Most of these hands are going to be very easy to flop. People are going to have a better hand or a good draw far more often than they will on a dry board, which is something to the something of the kind of like king eight to rainbow, all different suits. A board like that is very difficult for people to hit. All the sort of medium pocket pairs have flopped sort of mediocre hands. All the suited cards have failed to flop flush draws. How many King X is the guy really playing? It depends on the player type, but probably not that much. So generally it's hard to make a very strong hand on those boards. So what does this mean when it comes to check raising? Well, it means that we want to we don't want to be check raised bluffing boards that people hit all the time because we're just not going to get that many folds unless we know that they're very tight and they're capable of making big folds and maybe we're planning to fire turns in rivers. But that aside just now, I just want to talk about sort of check raising in a vacuum and how often it's going to need to work and how often it will work on certain boards. So we don't want to be sort of targeting the really, really wet boards. We want to be more going after drier flops. But there's a little bit of a catch here because if we target really dry flops against people who are aware of what's going on, the problem is that leads us to our next part here, representing hands and draws. We just can't really do that, unfortunately, on really dry boards. So what are good board textures to check raise on? Well, the simple answer is board textures that you've flopped some equity on. But if you don't have equity and you want to do it anyway, then sort of look for... If your opponent's not very thinking, you know, if he's very sort of basic, maybe you can get away with doing it on the drier boards because you'll have missed those more often and you won't have to worry about him just plainly having a hand to continue with. Um, but if he's more sort of thinking, then you want to probably do it on boards that you can represent at least a good amount of sets on some two pair and maybe some draws and pair plus draw, combo draw sort of combinations as well. So think about board texture and think about it not just on its own but in conjunction with who your opponent is and what you'd be repping. So representing hands and draws, is it always important? No, because there are certain weak players who will just fold all the time anyway. There are players that you can check raise on queen, six, two, rainbow against, and they'll just fold because they don't really have a grasp of, they're not really thinking so far as to what you're representing. They're more thinking about their own hand, and they just have a pair of sevens on a queen high board, so for all they know, you could have a queen, so they better fold. Against these kind of guys who aren't putting you on that accurate of a range, because presumably 
you're not going to be check raising every top pair you flop it's just going to be too spewy and sort of over representing your hand but if they're not thinking like that then if you recall back to my last video and my last season which was called um, not my last video but like in the middle of that season of player type videos there was one called um, being the bully picking on the weak or something like that and that's exactly the kind of guy that you want to be you know attacking a board by check raising where you don't necessarily rep a very strong range because he doesn't think about your hand he just thinks about his own hand he's much more likely just to be folding because he has the pair of sevens on the queen high board and you could have a queen however if you're against a strong player then it's going to be much more the case that he is going to be looking at that board and thinking well he's only repping a set of sevens and a set of twos he had a three bet queen's pre flop he's only got six combinations of strong hands that beat me i don't think he even has like king queen here ace queen here which you might but if he doesn't put you on those hands then the point is he's not going to be folding anything and therefore you want to be very careful about check raising that kind of board against him equity is like a huge help this is quite basic but the more pot equity you have that is the more um, outs you have to making the best hand usually that can be equated to that in this sort of context and um, the more chance you have of pulling off a successful you know plus EV check raise as a bluff or semi bluff and the reason for that is that it doesn't need to work as often because sometimes when you get called you'll actually win a very large pot because you end up making the nuts so it's like a win-win situation when you're semi bluffing with a load of outs because if you take it down that's great you know you only had jack high currently but if you don't then you still have like nine outs over two streets to draw and if you have position maybe you get a free turn free river um to make your hand so the more equity you have the better that's not to say that you shouldn't check raise without equity because there are certain spots where you pick on the weak or you just take advantage of the fact that guys see bets too much or something like that and you just really capitalize on that but generally if you can even have so much as like a gut shot that's better than having air if you can have two over cards that's better than having an under pair you know pocket twos on queen eight three that has two outs to making the best hand whereas ace king on queen eight three that has considerably more has basically eight outs to making the best hand assuming that the most common hand you're going to get called by when you check raise is like top pairs type stuff so equity comes in two forms you know it comes in like immediate equity and it comes in other forms as well um, I'm going to refer to this fourth bullet point here in two different parts so back doors back door draws that is these are not immediate draws like they're nowhere near as strong as flopping like a flush draw or an open and straight draw or anything like that or even a gut shot but if you have a backdoor straight draw or backdoor flush draw or both then what that means is that there are way more turns you can actually continue bluffing on and be plus EV because remember I said on the flop if you have draws your bet needs to work you know your check raise has to work far less often in order to be profitable the same thing is going to apply on the turn so if you check raise you know just with a hand that has backdoor straight and flush draws although you won't turn those all that often when you do it might turn a uh, give up into a profitable continuation barrel so you might be barreling again on the turn there with your extra equity and you might be folding out a chunk of your opponent's range that you called with on the flop but it's now too weak to call on the turn or something like that and hopefully in the example hands in the next um, episode or maybe even in the live play today some of these examples are going to come up where we use backdoor equity to improve our chances not just of winning the hand by backdooring the the best hand on the river but also just by generating situations where we can bet the turn profitably and use that extra pot equity to help our fold equity on the turn and you know if we've got a better situation on a future street then it makes more sense to be being aggressive on a previous street generally if we have better prospects as the hand plays out we want to be putting more money into the pot and if our prospects are going to get worse and worse as the hand plays out say we have a low pair that's going to become weaker and weaker then it doesn't make so much sense to be putting money into the pot as a very general thing i'm flying through a lot of material here i'm covering a lot of stuff because this is sort of supplementary to the last how to master we're talking about all the same topics if you feel this is too much of a brief over through or run through you know go back and watch those like don't don't feel that you need to be getting like absolutely everything out of this run through here because I'm trying to do this quickly I'm trying to do this as a recap an overview before we get into the real nitty-gritty of the video which is the examples and that's where it's at in this season it's all about the examples so what about when we are check raising for value um, the first thing to be said is that always know why you're doing it and don't over represent your hand because say you flop sort of top pair um, this is a very 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 common live players mistake beginning players mistake and tournament players mistake who you know tournament players who don't play a whole lot of cash 
Um, let's say we flop pocket 8 south of the big blind and the flop comes 7, 6, 3 and our opponent bets the flop and he's opened in you know, the hijack let's say. So his range is going to contain some over pairs, some over cards, some draws, some stuff he's see betting that's missed the board and also some hands that beat us. So pocket 8 is probably the best hand more than half the time here. We're not going to be folding to this bet. Um, we're going to be at least calling. However, if we raise, what happens is we just fold out all the air and all the weak stuff and all the overcards, and the only thing that continues against us is going to be sets and better overpairs, basically. So with pocket eights on the 763 board, what we're really doing effectively by raising against a fairly tight, non crazy villain there is turning our hand into a bluff, over representing our hand, putting so much money into the pot that if that amount of money is met by our opponent, that's to say if he calls us, we're going to be in very poor shape because we'll have eliminated all the weaker hands that we were doing well against from his range and therefore we should just be calling in that spot instead. So we need to ask ourselves the second question here. What is our opponent continuing with? That's going to be crucial to know because we may be, it doesn't matter if we're like a billion light years ahead of his range for making a bet, if we're not ahead of his range for continuing against our raise, then raising that bet starts to become pretty ludicrous and nonsensical. This is another thing that beginning players do, another common misconception that you'll hear Phil Helmuth talk about, or maybe Doyle Brunson, because Texas Dolly Doyle Brunson is the man, so when you read Super System, a book that was written, let me point out, in the 70s, when poker was basically in its infancy, when no one really knew anything about poker. You know, Super System was a good work, but then I'm sure there were books written about how the world was flat and things like that back in the day before Columbus. So the point is, don't raise to find out where I'm at. Don't do that because it's not a very good reason to put lots of money into the pot. You're usually, if you're a competent poker player and you have any idea about how your opponent plays, and you're de decent enough post-flop, or even if you're not, you're still going to have some conception of where you're at in hand. You shouldn't have to put in money into the pot and create a situation where that money only goes into the pot when you're crushed to find out where you're at. Yes, you found out where you're at, well done, you're now going to be folding, but you've just wasted a hell of a lot of money in the process. If you're one of these guys that either has to raise the flop to find out where they're at or they're going to stack off with a hand like pocket eights in that spot, then just stop stacking off with it. You know, you don't have to make these nonsensical plays just to protect yourself against your own stationary tendencies. Just stop to being a station, <laughs> I guess is what I'm getting at there. So yeah, there's no reason to find out where you're at. Um, there might be like times where you would check raise to find out where you're at, but they'd be so few and far between and they would involve being very deep in a situation where you really don't want to make a big mistake in the pot and you know exactly, you know, if your opponent continues to the check raise you know exactly the kind of range he has and if he if he folds you know exactly the kind of range he has air but this is the stupid thing about this play like when your opponent folds you've found out where you're at but the hand is now over if your opponent continues often you found out where you're at and you're crushed and now you've just put more money into the pot than you have to so it's just nonsensical for the most part in fact forget i even said there were good spots to do it for that reason it's not a good reason on its own ever and that's why I've put block capitals and loads of question marks and exclamation marks to kind of show that it's ludicrous. Okay, villain type is very crucial. Um, for instance, you can get away with raising flops, check raising flops wider for value against really stupid villains. When I say wider for value, I mean with a larger value range with some weaker hands than you would, would normally check raise for value with. So if your villain is like, seriously a station and just cannot fold and likes to find out where he's at because he's an idiot and he bets to find out where he's at but he's going to continue anyway then you can probably get away with raising top pair there for value but against a regular who's only going to be continuing with stronger hands if he gives you respect then you can't get away with that or you're going to end up falling into the trap of bullet point one and bullet point two not asking the question in two and therefore committing the, f the fault of one and over repping your hand so you need to be careful about that um that said, there are spots where you do want to be raising top pair and stuff for value, and these occur more and more against regulars as you move up against fish and stuff. You know, you can do them micros and low stakes, but as you move up and you play like 100, 200 NL, even 50 NL actually, you'll find that players don't give you any respect when you check raise certain boards because you just rep very few combinations and maybe you only rep sets. Maybe you don't even have the low pocket pair in your range pre flop because, like we've talked about, it's often bad to flat those out of position pre flop unless you're multi-way or against some kind of really tight range. So the point is that usually you rep quite a narrow range for value when you check raise. It's a, it's a sort of line that shows extreme strength and therefore it's polarizing. 
If it's polarizing, what it means is that it leaves you a range consisting of very strong hands and very weak hands. And if that's the case, then a regular uh, 100NL is more likely to put you on bluffs or draws than he is to put you on sets. The reason being, it's very, very difficult to flop a set. It only happens like one in nine times you flat with a pocket pair, and a lot of the times you flat pre-flop, you won't have a pocket pair. So it's one in nine times of, again, another fraction, which is going to be a very small amount of time that you're actually able to flop a set. Therefore, if you raise, your opponent might put you on nothing, and he might be calling you too much. So what does this mean? It means that you should find this niche, and what you should do instead of just being really polarized and only raising with sets and air, is actually raise with like top pair good kicker hands. Because if he's calling down with ace high and any sort of pair to try and take advantage of the fact that you are perceived as being very polarized and often very bluff heavy, then what you need to do is widen your value range. There's that word again. You know, include words in it. Sorry, include hands in it that you wouldn't normally include. Maybe like king queen on queen xx, queen jack on queen xx boards these kind of things because then if your opponent wants to 3-bit bluff you you can just have a hand to flat with if your opponent wants to start calling you down then you have a hand that's way ahead of his calling range if he's calling too wide because he thinks that you don't rep anything so on these boards where we said that we need to be careful about what we rep against strong players it follows from that that we can actually do it more for value and check raise a wider value range against those guys on those boards again questions or comments about this this is a run through so leave me them um, I will be checking the the comment part of all these sort of introductory presentation videos because the presentations are brief and co any con any sort of concepts you see in the abstract that you don't understand I'll go through and quite happily explain if you leave me a little comment on the thread so feel free to do that. In 2012 like what's actually changed? What's different? Um, as we move up we do need to take care about what we rep. We can't be like really unbalanced I guess is what I'm trying to get at here to be careful against players who are good hand readers and there are more good hand readers now than there were a year ago or two years ago or three years ago because these days people are members of poker sites you know poker is more poker learning is more mainstream more people get coaching more people watch videos more people make a real effort to get better at the game because the games are tougher and that leads to people making a real effort to get even better and so exponentially the games get tougher and tougher and people are better hand readers so as you move up, you need to be a bit careful about what you're repping, and you need to sort of change your range so that you're a step ahead of your opponent. So if they think that you're always full of shit in a spot, you've actually got some value hands, and if they think that you're just for value in a spot, then you're bluffing and taking advantage of that. So you need to be more aware, basically, of what you're representing, what your perceived range is going to be against certain people, and what you should then do to adjust based on those conclusions. Um, so yeah, you should look for smaller edges everywhere because as you move up in stakes, it gets harder and harder to get to the next level. You know, it's tougher to move up from 50 to 100 than it is from 25 to 50, and it's tougher to move up from 25 to 50 than it is from 10 or 16 to 25. So as you move up, you need to look for these little spots where it might be marginally plus EV to check raise and you wouldn't normally do it. You normally just fold because you give yourself some stupid reason like, I don't know that much about my opponent, or you make some kind of lame excuse and don't do it. But the point is that you should do it because even if it's just marginally plus EV, you need every little edge you can get. So grab those edges and don't be, don't be lame about it. Yeah. Here's my disclaimer though. Um, Micros are still micros. When I say the games are getting tougher, I don't mean that the 10 and L game that you grind is actually like full of pros. It might be full of like weird pros in very poor countries who can actually make a living by playing 10 and L. I, I think that happens, actually, but they won't be that great usually. Generally, it'll be full of fish. It'll be full of regs who are still learning their basics, still finding their footing. So games like 10, 25, 5 and L, these kind of stakes, you know. Take everything I've just said with a pinch of salt and don't think that you have to be a step ahead of everyone. You're just going to level yourself. You know, if you play against bad regulars who are just very ABC and don't think very much, or you're playing against fish who just call down too much or whatever they do, they have very obvious mistakes and they don't think too much again, then if you're sort of, well, what do I rep here? You know, I don't rep this. He's going to expect that I have this in my range, but really my range is depolarized here because I'm going to exploit him by merging my range in this river. Like, try and avoid all that shit. It's not good. It's not clever against someone who's not thinking. Against someone who's not thinking, you don't have to do anything fancy like that. You don't have to find every small edge and, like, increase your variance. You can just basically take all your big edges and 
you know, you can crush the guy. So if you're not sure about whether a spot's plus EV and you're still playing like 5, 10, even 25, no limit, like you definitely don't need to worry about the fact that the games are getting that tougher. They are going to be a bit tougher than they were, but they're still extremely beatable, and so you don't need to do too much crazy stuff, you, you know. This is a disclaimer, like don't go absolutely crazy thinking on meta levels about what he thinks you think about what he thinks about you because people just generally don't even reach the first level of what your hand might actually be a lot of the time they're still thinking about their own range or just randomly arbitrarily putting you on a hand like ace king because they saw, saw a guy show down ace king once this kind of thing so yeah don't get too don't get too fancy play syndrome is i guess what i'm hitting on here okay that brings us to the end of end of that little presentation um next time we're going to talk about well, we're going to do a hand history review, basically, from start to finish. Just lots and lots of spots where it be check raise, or I might look at some spots where some of my students check raise at lower stakes, so we've got a bit more of a sort of array, a variety of hands. But for now, what we're going to do is load up four tables and do a little bit of grinding and do a little bit of check raising and look out for some spots to sort of show you guys um, what we've been talking about, sort of illustrate these concepts. So... What I'm going to do is mix stakes. I think that's probably best because everyone plays different stakes. I don't just want to fire up 100 NL. I don't just want to fire up 5 NL. I want to fire up like a table of everything sort of in between because if I can find what stars of stars is done with the filter, there it is. Okay, so we'll do one of 50 as well. 50 NL. There we go. I might get confused and start sizing my opens like 13x because I'm disorientated, but that's okay. Alright, one, two, let's grab another two tables. This time we're going to go down to micro stakes and we'll do 110 and 125. I'm not going to do 16 NL because it's already confusing enough playing like lots of different stakes without having to make my opens 48 cents. Thanks very much. 16 NL is just a strange, strange stake. My girlfriend just started playing 16 NL recently and she gets kind of disorientated with the the random sizing, like it's okay when it's like 3xing, you know, you get used to that stuff but then when you're trying to work out how to actually size a squeeze that's going to be like 5.5x, it gets a bit confusing um, there's one of 25 and now we'll bring up one of 10 and L, I believe, yeah I'm not going down to 5, 2 and L or 5 and L just because you guys will be moving up from those sticks very soon anyway. Hopefully you're not going to be stuck at 5 and L or anything for a long time. So it's good to see how the games above you play out. And we have a whole micro stakes subset of videos for anyone that is wanting to learn about 2 NL or 5 NL. But yeah, 10 NL is very basic. It's not too different from those stakes. In my I mean, it is going to be a bit different. People don't make such horrendous mistakes. But it's not going to be like terribly bad or anything. Um... I just close this shit. Okay, so here we have four tables. I'm going to try and get into as many spots as possible while not being spewy. Because I don't want to mislead people by like playing loads of dodgy hands that might be okay for me to play. Because I can beat these games quite easily. But if you were to play these games and, you know, say your, your regular game is like 10 or 25 no limit, then it might not be good to get into that kind of spot. So I'm going to sort of balance trying to get into lots of situations with not being a complete sputard. So yeah. But hopefully we get some good spots um, on the flop to check raise. And we're not just going to be looking at spots where it's good to check raise, we're going to be looking at spots where it's good not to check raise. And try and look at some of the misconception situations where people check raise too much when they shouldn't and things like that as well. Um, I need to organize this a bit better because it's confusing. I think what I'll do is have the higher stakes at the top left going down this way. And stars is good this way. If I arrange them like that and then tell it to tile, it'll know what I mean. Yeah. Stars is just awesome for software. I highly recommend it for anyone who's not American and can actually play on stars. Although it depends what you want out of a poker site. Like software for me is like a big thing. If I'm spending a lot of time grinding, I really want to enjoy that. And the thing with stars is, you always find games. If you if you can be bothered to really put a lot of effort into table selecting, you can always find good games. That's not always the case in other sites. There are other sites at these stakes where 
you know, I'm talking about 50, 100 NL, where the games are really bad at certain times of the day and things like that. Stars, that's never the case. You will always find a game if you're willing to table select hard enough and be a bit patient. And start tables. So we're going to be flatting as much out of the blinds as we can to try and get into situations where we can talk about whether it's good or not to check rates. Um, that said, I'm not going to be, like I said, I'm not going to be being a complete spewtard and flatting like King 8 offsuit to a random open. By the way, just to take you through my colour coding very quickly, because um, it should help to to show um, what kind of players my opponents are. You'll notice at the top too, because I've played these stakes before um, a, a good amount, I've got you know tags on these guys, but not so much at the bottom. Um, 7 4, like. This guy's fold to big blind to steal is 84%, so he's almost the kind of guy I want to be opening every small blind against, but I'm just going to fold this one, because he is somewhat of a regular, he's like, a, that's what the lime green means, it means sort of taggy, but nitty taggy sort of player. Uh, but I want to show him that I can fold a small blind, and then I'm going to look to um, steal like everyone after that. I'll fold only the worst hands, like if that was 7-4 suited, I'd open versus that guy because he folds his big blind so much. I'm going to flat threes on the button. Remember, this isn't just about check raising. We want to talk about all the other spots that come up as well, um, because it's a great spot to set mine. We have an open, we have position, um, we have very high chances of getting a multiple pot because we have this fish, this 43-14 in the big blind. We also have this guy in the small blind who might come along anticipating a four-way pot as he does here. Um, we're not going to be stabbing it at this. Just for the record, if one of these guys bet, this would be like the worst spot in the entire world to raise as a bluff, because. The thing is, we have like two outs. Remember, I was talking earlier about it's much better if we can have like over cards, backdoor draws, just because we have way more outs. Um, if we only have two outs to make the best hand, you know, to make a set or boat here, then that sucks. And also, if someone bets four way, what's their range like? Remember, we also need to look at how strong the betting range ranges are that we're planning on raising against. If someone bets four way here, they probably have at least an ace a lot of the time or a good draw. So we can't really expect too much fold equity. Here's another thing, this guy is passive. If he was to bet, then raising the flop would be really bad against him because firstly, he probably has an ace or better a huge amount of the time. Secondly, we only have two outs when called. And thirdly, he's a passive stationary player, so trying to get him to fold top pair will be an absolute nightmare. So yeah, that's pretty much, if someone bet there, that would be your nut example of a spot where it'd be really terrible to check raise. Okay, so here we check the queen eight out of the big blind. Um, a lot of players will check here, and like go into check call mode against a random. That's fine, but I I think this guy is like some kind of fish. He's like a bronze star, and he's not fully stacked, so he's probably quite passive. So I'd rather just lead out here and try and get called by like ace high, or a pair of twos or sixes or some pocket pair basically. Our fish here donks. Um, we have a couple of options, like we can raise fold, that's to say we're going to raise, this isn't the kind of spot I'm talking about in the video by the way, because note that we're the preflop raiser here, so this isn't like a check raise or raise situation as we've been talking about it, this is just a fish donks it. So I'm going to raise just because, am I? I really don't want to get 3 bet, he's about 2 bucks though, it's like so small that I don't even want him to draw to like his gut shots, and yeah I'm going to throw in a small raise here, because I don't want him to draw to like gut shots and flush draws like super cheap, and I think Oh wow, he clicks it back. That's what we didn't want to happen. Um, and also, I think that he just has like air that we can protect against. He can have like overcards here and stuff. So there's nothing wrong with just taking down the pot. He makes this like so incredibly cheap, but he's like a random passive player um, who probably has a really strong range here. And we only have two outs, so we're calling like five bucks into a pot of twenty-five. You know, we need like we're only going to make our set on the turn like one time in like twenty four or something like that. So we need even better odds. And if we're going to go with the the read that his range is really strong, which I think we can. Um, I don't think it's too bad just to go ahead and fold here. I definitely don't think that's too bad a thing. So that's what I'll do for now. If it turns out he's crazy, then I wouldn't. I would just call there, but then I probably wouldn't raise the flop in the first place because I don't really want to be in that position. Um, so here, this guy limps under the gun and then he min raises my ISO from the small blind. Firstly, I'm putting this guy on some very strong hands, like some good pocket pairs, maybe like ace king hands he's very happy with, but more weighted towards sort of aces through jacks. That said, we need to call here because we're getting an amazing price and we have a hand that can flop really well sometimes. So when you're getting that good a price pre flop, there's just absolutely no way that you can fold there. 
Okay, what about check raising in a 3-bet pot here? Let's apply what we've just been talking about. I don't think it's good here at all. The reason is that this guy's range is very strong. If he bet there, although we do have equity, which is one of the plus things that we were looking for, remember, the problem is... The problem is that his range is just too strong, and so if we don't have any fold equity, our pot equity isn't actually going to be all that great. So we might actually have to... Um, sorry, let me just play these two hands. This guy raises again. It's like the second time he's been spewy on the flop or been aggro. I'm not folding top pair at this point in the hand. I'll see what he does in the turn. A lot of time, these guys like to slow down the turn. If he like completely blasts it or whatever, I might find a fold and just await like a better spot. I'm going to check again here on table three, just because it's very likely a guy like this who limps under the gun and then checks the flop either has one of two things. Like firstly, he's either slow playing. I'm going to call one more here and evaluate the river. This guy just looks really speary so far. Um, he's either slow playing like pocket kings or pocket aces or pocket tens or something huge like that. Or he has a hand like queens or jacks that he's probably really happy with pre-flop, but he's now not going to fold. This really sucks on table one. Like Honestly, I don't expect to have the best hand here very often at all. But this guy's been like super spazzy so far. And yeah, I... I'm getting such a good price I just can't fall through but I do expect to lose a lot yeah okay and that pretty much goes to show that we were right to fold the first hand it's probably just the case that he's picked up a huge hand like twice against us in a row which is fine um, but yeah I mean I think there are arguments for folding the turn there I don't think we can fold the river because it's just such a great price so if that fish happens to be oh wow we win with the queen high so if that fish happens to be like really bad just like you know, one in five times he happens to be a crazy who doesn't know what he's doing, then it's going to be an easy call. But I do expect to lose there the majority of the time, basically. And just because I saw him go a bit mental in the first hand, I didn't feel like I could fold on the flop. Um, the turn, I mean, his bet's so small again, we're getting a great price, it's difficult to fold there. If I hadn't seen him do anything previously, I'd probably call the flop and then just fold when he bets the turn. But you know, I've already seen him like dunk and then like click it back at me like that, so it's more likely that he's sort of full of shit there than it would be normally. So yeah, that would be a very bad spot to check raise just because the guy's range is strong in general. I mean, let's see what he had. It might not be strong if he can't beat queen high, but we need... Okay, so yeah. <laughs> so every now and then the fish will turn up with 6-9 offsuit, of course, but usually if someone limps under the gun and then min raises your isolation rays, they usually have a very strong range. I would think this guy is clearly just insane. Maybe he misclicked. Like basically his play is horrible. Like he's taken this crazy bluff line where he has no fold equity pre-flop whatsoever with 9 high and then he's got post-flop on a board that you know he can represent quite well and he's just given up and chosen to show down his 9 high so yeah that works for us that's pretty good for us we also need to I'm going to give this guy the passive fish tag and I'm just going to say that he um Just to say that he min raises flops with strong hands and then he bets future streets really small. If the guy started blasting there, like I would have folded, but we're just getting such a good price and what we've seen from him before, I just don't think it's really possible for us to fold that river. And the turn, I'm not, not, I don't know that I like a fold on the turn either, basically, based on what we've seen. If we had a better kicker with our jack, it'd be like fist bump call down because people like to do this with top pair, but remember, 43 7 can easily just show up with like jack x there. You know, we only have 14 hands in the guy, I've seen him be aggro, he can have jack x, he can have like middle pair or something like that, so it's hard to flop sets, basically. But he can have better jacks as well, which is why I expect to lose most of the time. I don't expect to see a set most of the time, not at all, especially the set of jacks that there's only one combination of, but I expect to see sort of better top pairs a lot there. That said, you can't fold if you only need to be good like one in six times. And there he sort of bets three streets with like bottom pair and stuff, so he's clearly like... I think we ran into the absolute top of his range. But he's the kind of guy you want to be playing lots of pots with. He's clearly just all over the place. Which is fun. This is Sunday in the UK, Sunday afternoon, so what that means is the tables are a good bit looser than usual. I hope some check raise spots come up, or some spots that we can at least talk about how good it would be to check raise. Okay, so here, um, we're not going to 3-bet. 
the reason we're not going to 3-bet at this 25 NL table is because we really don't want to blow our Polish friend here out of the pot. He's the guy that limped and then min raised with the 6-9 off. So the last thing we want to do is force him out of the hand. And also, even if he wasn't in the hand, like we don't really have any idea what this guy's continuing with to our 3-bet. So we don't want it to be the case that he's just folding out all the better hands or anything like that. Sorry, all the worse hands. So we flop King, Queen, X. Let's talk about if this guy wasn't in the hand. Do I like raising if this guy bets the flop? I think it's fine because it just looks like we're full of shit and there's another reason as well is that he only has ten dollars so if we think that he's like a thinking player then raising's good because he's going to call us with like any queen and he might even play back at us however it's not standard and better is calling if we don't know anything about the guy and that's because if we raise we're basically we could just be raising against a guy who is ABC and straightforward and is just going to look at the board and say well I have ace seven I've missed that queen high board I'm gonna give it to him so generally there we shouldn't assume that we can raise king queen for value even blind versus blind however if we have a dynamic with the guy and we know he's a thinking regular which he probably isn't because he's a random like nine dollar stack at 25 no limit but if we did think that then maybe we would raise to sort of level him and sort of protect our bluffing range and sort of like we said before it's a board texture where we just don't have very many good hands on it's hard to hit that board it's extremely dry it's very difficult to hit it so I'm going to raise here. I wouldn't normally do this. It's just this guy's so horrifically bad that I just want to isolate him and play lots of pots with him. I don't even care, like, that we have an offsuit ace. I'm just going to see about here, um, expecting to get lots of folds, because he seems really fit or fold, just given the fact that he played that 6-9 hand the way he did. Here I'm going to call. I wouldn't normally flat 7s to 4x on the button if it was just this guy. The reason is it plays kind of awkwardly out of position. It's quite a big investment pre-flop and we don't have that great implied odds because presumably the guy's button range is wide so if we flop a set we don't get paid that much however we have a psychopath here who's always going to be coming along so when we do flop a set it's just so good because when he flops top pair he's likely never going to be able to fold so our implied odds there don't come from this guy they come from the fish and the blinds who's ahead of us and who we expect to play really badly this would be a terrible spot to check raise because a guy with a low c bet 57% has bet into two people, right? So that's one bad factor. The second bad factor is again we have the dreaded underpair that only has two outs when called by better hands. And we aren't going to call by anything worse, so that's certainly going to be the case if we're called. Um, thirdly, there's a fish to act afterwards who isn't going to fold like a pair of queens even if we do raise a lot of the time. So basically, fold equity is terrible. Our prospects for turning or rivering any equity or the best hand are terrible and the guy's range who's betting is really strong because he's 57% c-bet and he's bet into two players so basically it's a very very easy fold and it would be a horrendous horrific spot to check raise um, the 6-6 six, six opens here um, I'm just going to 3-bet as a bluff like I haven't done anything yet it looks really credible he's like quite a tight player I assume that ace 10 is a bit too weak just to flat here readless but I think it has a blocker and there's a lot of hands in his range he's just going to have to fold basically hands he's not comfortable flatting out of position with because he's like a 10 NL tighter player hopefully and he's probably a supernova who if he's a supernova playing um, 10 no limit then he's clearly playing a lot of tables basically as well that's another consideration so I flat ace 9 out of the big blind just because it's far too strong to fold blind versus blind um, 3 betting is an option but I also think it's too strong to 3 bet I think it's better just to call what do I think about raising this board um, I don't really like it I think calling this board is okay depending on how much this guy c bets like if i i just think if i raise here um like it's wasting far too much money to try to take down the hand because if called our equity sucks and i think we can float here and expect him to give up on the turn a lot because when we call here we have a lot of queens and tens in our range um we do have a backdoor draw i mean i'm just gonna call like i'm gonna flat float one here basically um on table four i'm just gonna check back here i think queen eight nine is a board that smashes a 3-bet calling range here. He just has so many strong hands on this kind of on this kind of board and I have a gut shot that I don't want to get blown off so I want to take a free card and try and turn a jack or an ace which might even give me the best hand. I bet the turn here because we floated just with the intention of taking it away on a future street. One important reason that floating there is far better than raising is just that it's the kind of board that this player is going to be giving up on a lot on the turn. Why is he going to be giving up a lot on Queen 10 X in the turn? The reason is that when we call that board, we have a lot of hands that are strong enough to call two streets. So we have a lot of hands that are, you know, going to be able to call. 
the flop and the turn because they're going to either be like second pair or better. So he probably doesn't have a lot of folds unless he bets like three there. On table four, we decide to bet the the turn because and we bet it quite small. We're trying to get called by hands like oh I don't know like a queen, king, queen that was unable to bet the flop or something like that. Um, what is really calling us here that we beat? Maybe like pocket jacks, pocket tens will call one. It has like the gut shot and stuff as well. I don't think we're getting called by like too many worse hands here. So I think we should bet quite small. So I'm only going to bet like 140 here because I don't think he has too many worse aces in his range. So we're trying to get called by like queen x or pocket jacks or something. Therefore we need to bet like a bit less than half pot to allow that to happen. Although our, our hand might look quite strong, there really aren't that many worse hands that can call. So yeah, going back to this hand on table 2, it's really important basically that he's not going to be barreling us. If he's going to be barreling us, then raising becomes better than um, floating. However, I don't like raising there just because it looks really full of shit, like blind versus blind, so again, that's another one of our factors, remember, if we don't think we're going to get a lot of respect. Positions come into that too. You know, if you're like against an under the gun opener and you raise their c-bet, you probably get more respect than you do blind versus blind. That's not to say that you should do that more often when you're against an under the gun range, because their range will be a lot stronger. This is a minefield, I know. But basically, it means that you need to be more aware of the fact you'll get a bit more respect. So maybe some spots become better or better than they would normally be. But blind versus blind, we're not going to get very much respect at all, which is a problem. Um, we don't have that many great backdoors. I mean, we do have a backdoor flush and straight draw with our nine of hearts, but it's a low one. It's a weak one. Um, it's not exactly going to make us the best hand super often. Um, and yeah, I just feel like f if we couldn't float profitably there, I'd rather just fold. I don't think it's a good spot to raise, basically. Any questions about the hand, leave them for me. I think it's quite interesting. Again, we're going to call here. We're in position. We have a fish stacked after us. It would be better if the fish was deeper stacked. But he's so bad that that pretty much makes up for the fact that he doesn't have all that much money in front of him. Uh, we get called once here. I'm just going to keep betting. Usually I would bet fold this spot because he's... You know, if he if he raises this turn, it's just highly likely that he's flopped an extremely strong hand and was slow playing. Now this jack turn, like, do we really get called by very many worse hands? Like, we maybe get called by, like, king-queen. Even king-jack has just got there. Is he even going to bet king-queen if we check? I don't think so. Um, does he have king-10 here? I don't know. Is he ever going to call with a hand worse than a king? I don't think so. Um, can he fold King Queen if we bet? Yeah, probably for sure because we just rep like so many strong hands firing three streets when the flop is three way. Therefore, this is a check fold because we can't bet for value on this card, and I don't expect him to be betting very many worse hands when we check here. I think if he has like King Queen or something, he'll be folding it a lot of the time if we bet, and he'll be checking it back if we check. Therefore, it's far too thin to bet this river. We just need to check and fold, and it's a good spot to check fold top here in the river. Like, we've already bet two streets. His range is clearly... If, unless he's really, really bad, he's not going to be just calling down with, like, a random King X, and he shouldn't have that many random King X in his range. Note his V-Pip and Preflop Rays are very close together, so I don't think it's likely that he has that much, like, King 9 sort of stuff here. Yeah, it's Pocket 7s, wow. Okay, so we need to take a note that he's just calling the flop lighter than expected. I'm also going to give him like a fish tag because he calls the flop like multi-way with a pair of sevens with a fish tag after him. I think it's like well, another player tag after him. I think it's pretty poor. Uh, this guy bets a dollar here. I assume this is usually for value just based on how passive he is. I'm not going to call with sixes even though I'm getting a great price. Whereas this guy up here we'd seen him do some spewy stuff and we were getting like five to one on the river to call. Here we're only getting like three to one and he seems very passive post-flop so those would be the differences in those situations as to why we call one and not the other. Um, it's a very vague sort of general note, but it'll give me a good feel for future situations against this chump. Oh, I want to find out what that net called us with in that 3 bet pot, because I don't remember seeing it. Okay, so we had King Queen. That's like one of the only hands we're trying to get called with. His range is quite weak, so we're making a river bet like fairly weak as well. The other thing is I don't really think he has all that much Queen X. I don't think there's too many 
too many Queen X combos that a guy is flatting, a tight player is flatting out of position, cut off versus button through the first three bit of a session against someone who's not done anything yet, which is us. So I don't think he has like Queen Jack, Queen 10 there very often. Ace Queen beats us. King Queen is like the only combo I expect to see with any frequency. So I really need to get called by like stuff like Jacks and stuff like that, 10s as well. So that's why I make my bet so small there. Like it's kind of a thin value bet, it's kind of gross, it's just the fact that it's a 3 bet pot, it just means he doesn't have like low aces in his range and he doesn't have like, you know, loads of queens in his range or anything. If he had lots of ace x in his range it would be like a slam dunk bigger bet for value, but we're not really targeting any strong hands for value when we bet there, that's why we have to size smaller. Okay, so this guy makes a small 3-bet, he hasn't done very much yet, he seems to be some kind of short stacker dude. Um, if he's like multi-tabling, then I expect him to be 3-bet and wider, but you know, he's just a random with a random stack size. Usually I'd never fold to this price, but here, the problem is that he just doesn't have any money for us to win if we actually make our hand which really sucks, so I think we can just make a really tight fold there because our implied odds are so bad. If we do flop an over pair, we're often going to be bad getting it in. He could just be seriously tight. He could be like just some short sacker that 3 bets a lot, in which case shoving is fine there because we have a pair that's going to have decent equity when called against stuff like ace-king and stuff like that, which is a considerable part of his range for stacking off. Um, and also we're going to have some fold equity and picking up all that dead money, picking up those like 10, 11 big blinds is definitely a good thing. So if we know more about the guy and we know that he's... um. He's. If we know he's really tight with three bets and stuff, and he's a short stack, you know, we can fold there. If we know he's like one of these short stackers that three bets a lot, then we can shove there. And if he has a fuller stack and he makes it that size, then we can call there. Without any information, I would err on the side of folding. I'm just going to check and try and show down King High here. I don't expect this guy to bet unless he has like a much better hand than me, so. So, yep. Yeah. Alright guys, I'll play a few more hands. I know this video hasn't been like full of check raise spots. It's not really anything I can do something about because it's random hands that are coming up live, but I have tried to talk about them when flop comes up, so hopefully that's been of use. But I will say that the next video I make where I'm gonna be, you know, specifically going over these hands, those kind of spots is gonna be much better. Okay, here's a spot that fits in nicely on table one with what we were talking about. Let me just isolate this guy first. If he wants to min raise me here again, that's fine. Ah, oh, was this guy's um open from there? Oh, it's quite. Right. I'm gonna three bet bluff here. I've got very good image on table two, basically, a very very good image, and I know the guy can fold to c bets, and I know he's open from the hijack like a good amount before. So just check that. So that's fine. So we get randomly raised really small. Um, I'm definitely not folding here because like just set many odds on their own are just great. But I'm not gonna four bet and get it in. That'd be far too spewy. Um. I'm just going to make a... Am I even going to bet this flop? Like, no I'm not. I'm going to give up. I have almost no equity. And I think his range is like... going to consist of... a lot of ace x and also hands like kings and queens and stuff that aren't going to fold. Even now, like, what can I really get him to fold here? Like, kings? No, I doubt it. Maybe jacks, but maybe not even. Like, there's not so much fold equity here at all. Okay, I'll talk about all these hands in due course. He bets huge on the river, he's a tight player. I'm just always folding here, like this is always for value. He just has like no bluffs in his range, a pair of eights is never good. I'm basically trying to get called by Ace King here. That's why I bet so small. I think he has Ace King a lot when he takes this kind of line. I will explain all of these hands in just a second, and I'll explain why I don't like that guy's play at all. As soon as the dust settles... Okay, so... I think I explained the one on table 2. Basically the guy who calls, he's folded every time to 3-bet before that hand, like 3 out of 3 times. 
so when he actually does go ahead and defend his range is really strong the board hits him so well and we have no equity so barreling is like out of the question so we just end up giving up there i think it's pretty standard he bets huge on the river which just means that he just has no air in his range there's no bluffs he can have he's a tight player who's just been trying to get us to bet and then we haven't so then he bets his trips or whatever for pot on the river which is pretty standard okay jacks i want to talk about this hand first I'm going to sit out so I can go over the hands that have just happened before I wrap up. I'm going to talk about jacks first. And then I'm going to go back to the hand on table one. So this is not a good spot to check raise. The reason is that we're over repping our hand a bit. This is like an unknown at 25 no limit. If we raise here we're repping a lot of sets, good draws and things like that. So although we might be able to get called by some worse hands that he opens in the hijack, like maybe ace 10, he might not even have that many 10s and we can make value against those hands just by calling down a few streets anyway. If we get raised and then 3 bet there, we don't want to get it in. We're over repping our hand, we're folding out too many of the hands he might barrel like his air or his, you know, pocket 9s, pocket 10s, hands like that. Not pocket 10s, sorry, pocket 9s, pocket 8s stuff like that so just calling down here is like a more reliable policy basically um the river makes twos and sevens get there not hands i expect to see very often he could have an overpair here so i need to decide if i want to turn my hand into a bluff or not i don't think i do because the flush draw missed and i can see i'm just calling with an overpair here so i'm going to show down and hope he just has 10x or air or something like that he has a set which he's certainly not going to be folding Okay, so bad spot to raise on the flop basically just because we over rep our hand. We want to avoid doing that. We don't have enough history so that we can do that for value. It puts us in a terrible spot if we get 3 bet. Bad spot to raise. Okay, table 1. Let me skip back to the jack 10 hand. Got a couple of things to say about this. Firstly, I flat there at the small blind, it's completely fine, I'm getting a great price of a hand that is going to be able to check raise a lot as a bluff or semi bluff because it just flops so well and it's going to flop decent pairs to call down with, it's getting great pot odds, it's a mandatory call, if you're one of those guys that folds jack 10 there to that price, just stop doing it because it's bad. Um, on the flop, we check here, pretty standard, guy bets, again, like we do want to be levelling these guys by raising here with some hands because it looks so full of shit. This is like an uber dry board, but we don't want to do it with Jack Ten. The reason is that Jack Queen Jack, King Jack, and Ace Jack all beat us, as do all the over pairs. Our hands just slightly too weak. We want this to be part of our calling range, and we want to be raising instead with hands like King Jack, Ace Jack, maybe Queen Jack, but hands that we can get called by enough worse hands, and we're not like losing a ton of money against the bear jacks in his range when we blow pots like that. So yeah, I want to keep the pot a little bit smaller with the hand this week. And if we want to thinly raise this flop for check raise this flop for value, we should do it with a better jack or an overpair or something like that. Um, he checks the turn back, which is really bad because with king jack here, this is button versus small blind. Like I could be calling down with all these worst jacks. I could be calling down with like loads and loads of hands and then I bet the river small for value I'm going to try to get called here by like really bad jack or like a 6 or like a 9 that he's turned or something like that I could go a little bit bigger here probably but I think it's sizing is fine and he calls with king jack um, his play is just bad because he should be trying to build a pot and bet 3 streets quite large for value there he shouldn't be pot controlling and then just calling a small river bet and winning a small pot basically yeah his play sucks so sorry if that's you and you're watching this video, I just think you should bet three streets for value and take a pot control line with a weaker hand such as jack seven or pocket tens or something maybe. Alright guys, thanks for watching this. It's been fun to make. I'm hoping my slideshow comes up so I can like... Yeah, there we go. So next time we are going to talk about hand histories. We're going to look at lots of different hand histories of check raising and decide whether it's a good or a bad spot to do so. And that should be fun. It should illustrate in more detail the concepts we've been going over here. I know some decent hands came up there, but next time it will just be concentrated C bet. Sorry, check raise spots and nothing else. So stay tuned for that. Leave me any questions or comments about either the presentation or any of the hands that came up, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks very much.